Thank you, Dr. Chung. Um, it's certainly an honor to be here at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and it's a pleasure to get together again with Dean Chang. Um, he and I served together uh, in 2014 as on a review committee for the Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance um, after their fifth year, and got to know each other at that time, and it was, uh, it's a pleasure to renew our acquaintance here in, in Hong Kong. Um, my wife Josie is here with me as well, and we love Hong Kong. We've been coming here since I think 1987, so almost 30 years. A and uh, uh, it's one of our favorite cities in the world. Uh, so <laughs> to be honest, I first decided we would come here to, for R&R, &R, and then I thought, if I can arrange a talk, then I can get Duke University to help pay for this. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how it came to be, uh, to some degree. Uh, anyway, I've, I've had an interesting, uh, or it's been interesting to me, an interesting path and career that's kind of gone in and out of the academic world, and I might say a few words about that that might help you get a little bit of the texture of this, and it's a little bit of the basis for this talk. Um, but uh, I went through MIT undergrad and then Stanford for a PhD, and then went to Chicago and back to Stanford to, to, on the faculty, and I was teaching at Stanford. Um, and um, I gave a talk on hedging interest rate risks and futures, and one of the people in the audience there at the Chicago Board of Trade said, oh, uh, you know, we can sell this hedging uh, to clients. We can form a company. And his name was Smith and mine was Breeden. So we formed a company called Smith Breeden Associates. So while I was a Stanford professor, I had a consulting firm that I was building uh, on the side in 1982. Um, so it's now 30, uh, 34 years old, I suppose, Smith Breeden Associates. And uh, I had a dual career where I was teaching at Stanford and then I went to MIT for a year and went to Duke in 1985 and I've been at Duke for on and off for 30 years then from 85 to, to now 31 years. I had one year at, that I was chair professor at Carolina in the same place, University of North Carolina, uh, but mainly at Duke. Anyway, so uh, the, the business though as we developed it uh, morphed from a consulting firm into a money management firm. We started managing money in 1990 and grew it to $10 billion, um, but in uh, 1992, I was, it was too much. I was being a professor and trying to build my company at the same time, uh, so I gave up tenure at Duke, something I later regretted, <laughs> for, um, and, uh, and ran my business, stepped out and ran Smith Breeden from 92 to 99. Uh, so an academic career, kind of doing research, and then the business career, 92 to 99, and then by 99, we, had, we were making enough money, I thought I can go back and be a professor again and live, uh, live a good life. Uh, so I went, that's when I went a year to Carolina because Duke would not let me come back as a chaired professor at that point. And then after about a year, Duke realized that uh, the, the error of their ways and they asked me to be the dean. And I said, and you're gonna have to make me a chaired professor too. And they said, okay, you can have that. Uh, so I, I have not given up tenure since then or the chair or anything, although I just served as dean for six years. And I, I said, that's enough fun. I wanna go back and be a professor uh, from 01 to 07. So I've been a dean just like Eric has, is now. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed that. So I was an administrator. So, so I had seven years out in business, uh, 92 to 99, and then six years as a dean. And during those years, I wasn't, doing, uh, I wasn't doing advanced theoretical research, which I was kind of known for in my early years. I was doing applied research, and that's when I edited the journal Fixed Income and worked on mortgages. And I really applied option pricing to pricing mortgages and to hedging mortgages. Um, so that was my focus uh, then. But, but I feel like uh, Rip Van Winkle is the story in, the, in uh, fables that about someone who went to sleep for 20 years and then woke up later on, or Austin Powers would be a slightly more modern version of that. Uh, and so I, uh, I was not paying attention to research much at all during those times when I was running business and being a dean. And then when I stepped down from being dean, I started reading research again, financial research again. And, uh, and I, uh, I really got into it and I thought, this is, this is fun, I enjoy research and teaching. Uh, okay, well, then uh, my teacher and advisor, Bob Litzenberger, he was my dissertation supervisor at Stanford, called me and said, I've just been told that I won Financial Engineer of the Year. Uh, this was in 20, for 2012, this was early 2013, 
For, and he said, I think the reason that I won it is because of that paper that we did together that was uh, in my dissertation and, and that we published in 1978. That's Breeden Litzenberger, uh, Prices of State Contingent Claims, Implicit in Option Prices with the title. Um, and he said, it's become quite famous and quite well used. And I, I wasn't that aware. I hadn't been paying attention. Uh, so I started reading about and collecting all these papers that referred to our model. And that's where I found some, uh, and I think it's right up near the front here. You can see, like on the right-hand side, the 1996, the Bank of England quarterly had used the Breeden and Litzenberger approach. And, and then there's another one, the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis was using the Breeden and Litzenberger method. I, I had no idea that this was going on. So I was, I was pleased and shocked <laughs> at the same time. And then this is in 2011, uh, the European Central Bank was using, uh, if you go back to what they cited, they cited our work and they said, we're using the Breeden and Litzenberger method. So I thought this must be pretty cool that people are really using our, our model here. And I thought it was good, uh, but, uh, but you know, we always think our own works are good and uh, whether someone else thinks so is another matter. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, this, uh, so when Litz won this talk, and I went down to introduce him to the Museum of Mathematics in New York, um, I said, Bob, you know, that was 78 years ago. This was 2013. I said, uh, you know, it's been 35 years since we did that paper. I think it's about time we do another one. Uh, every 35 years, let's do a paper, you know, whether we want to or not. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm 65, and I will turn 66 in Hong Kong on this trip later on. Uh, so, and Litz is seven years ahead of me. Uh, so I, th I said after doing this, I thought, well, maybe we better pick up the pace a little bit uh, after this. Um, so we did this paper. I was uh, then asked to visit at MIT as, and was named the Fisher Black Visiting Professor at MIT. And that's where I was when he won this award. So walking around there, I thought we need to do a paper and I've got some ideas if they're using our work. Um, I, I think we, they can do it better. I think we can, we can do an, a, another version that's better than what people are doing. And that's how this paper started. So the paper, I think, was on your chairs. Uh, and it's still, I haven't even submitted it to a journal. It's been three years. This is something where I work on paper for many years, uh, usually. I'm very slow, uh, but usually reasonably high quality, but slow. Uh, all right. And, uh, uh, Steve Figluski saying, we'll publish it in the journal Derivatives if you want to, and so we may do it there. But in any case, this is that paper. This is how it came into being. Now, to tell you what our technique is that, uh, that I guess uh, is well used in Wall Street, uh, this is the simple example that if you have call options um, on securities with an exercise price of two, three, and four, and you've got an underlying asset that, that could have a price, let's say, a year from now that goes from one to n, then the payoff on a call with an exercise price of two is zero, zero. And then when it, it gets into money, if the price goes to three, four, five, six, and, and you get S minus X, the stock price minus the exercise price. So it's the standard hockey stick of payoffs. Uh, and then if you have an exercise price of three, then it goes zero, 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 and then the hockey stick angles up as well, and an exercise price of four. Now, now so the way this came about is when I was this uh, uh, poor PhD student at Stanford in about 76, 77, Litzenberger and I had read Steve Ross's work in 1976 on how you could span uh, payoffs with options, how adding options gave you additional uh, opportunities to bet on the underlying assets outcome. Um, and we had read that and we were talking about it and Litz said, you know, I think the difference between the value of an option with a strike price of two and a, a, an option with a strike price of three uh, must depend a lot upon the chances of being between two and three. Uh, because if the stock price ends up between two and three, then the two pays off something, but the three doesn't. So the two's value should be greater because of that probability. So that was his general idea, was that if you looked at the price of the, the option with a strike of two versus the option with a strike of three, the difference in their prices should reflect the probability or something like the probability of being between two and three. So I said, yeah, I agree, Bob, that makes sense to me. Uh, so I went off for about two weeks and worked on this and I, I solved it. Uh, I came back to him and I said, well, that's not right, but it's close, <laughs> it's close, uh, it's about right. And so then I went to uh, basically what I'd done in those two weeks was lay it out about like this. 
with two, three, and four, I had to bring in an option with a strike of four, because I basically said, if, uh, if you take the difference between the option with a strike of two, if you go long the two option and short the three, these are the payoffs you get. You just go long the two, uh, plus one of those, minus one of the three, and you take the difference of those two columns, and it's zero, zero, and then a bunch of ones. So it's, so that spread is not just the uh, going to pay off if the price is between two and three. Okay, but if you take a second portfolio, like a three minus a four, its payoffs are in this next column, zero, zero, zero like that, and then if you take a spread of these two spreads, go long this one, short this one, so it's long a one minus two, or long a two minus three, and then short a three minus four, so it ends up being long a two, short two threes, long a four, then you get this payoff. And for, uh, for financial economists, uh, that, that payoff is nirvana in a certain way, and it, it pays off only if the price ends up at three. So that's that spread of spreads, which I didn't even know it, but then traders told me that's a butterfly spread. When you go long one spread and short another, that's a butterfly spread. The one minus two, one uh, has payoffs that kind of look like a butterfly's wings, I suppose. Um, so that butterfly spread, though, then just kind of long a, long a two, short two threes, long a four, gives you a payoff exactly, in this case, if it pay, gives, you, gives you a $1 payoff if the price ends up at three, ends up with the middle price in the spread. So it's a pure bet. And you can get the prices of the two, the three, and the four, and then you take one minus two and one, and you, get, you end up getting the price of that portfolio that gives you the one. And so that's the price of kind of a $1 payoff if the, if the stock ends up at three. And it's a general method. Okay, the way I derived all this is quite general. So if you did a plus one three, minus two fours, and plus a five, kind of a butterfly centered around four, then it pays off at four. And if you do a butterfly pay, spread around five, it pays off at five. So you could essentially get all of these securities that that are called Arrow Securities by academics, named after Kenneth Arrow, who won a Nobel Prize from Harvard, Stanford. Uh, so we were applying the Arrow model here. So this gives us kind of the pricing of the fundamental basics of risk. And then uh, what, what I then went on to do, uh, I mean, we, we did this in our paper. We showed that you could price then uh, payoffs uh, by three months out. These are the prices of securities that pay off if the stock market goes like 1.1 1 .1 would be up 10%. One would be stock market stays the same. 1.1 1 .1 is up 10%. So this first payment, uh, this uh, between one and 1.1, 1 .1, uh, 34.8 cents, means that if you had, if you received one dollar, if it paid, if the stock market was up between zero and 10%, that payoff was worth 35 cents uh, today. So that's kind of, a, these are present value factors in a way that would discount risk properly using option pricing. Uh, so that's what we did in this method. Uh, I think I've got a little bit, this is the math, I call this, this is something I don't go over, in, in, you know, among friends or people I want to have remain friends. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but basically I showed it that butterfly spread, then as you take the limit on making the spread, instead of being $1 apart, you make it 50 cents apart and then 25 cents and then down to one penny, it converges to a second, second derivative of the call option pricing function with respect to the exercise price. So it becomes, so we've become famous essentially for this CXX, which is the second derivative of the call option pricing function, turns out to be the proper pricing density. Uh, I remember when Fisher Black saw this, he thought this is really cool. Uh, and uh, he, he said, I thought I, I found a result very similar to that. And he had. Uh, so you can actually then take the present value of almost any derivative security that has payoffs F of E, which is any general function of the underlying asset's price, by just integrating the payoffs with this second partial derivative. So, Enough. I to, I'll, I'll get out of cyberspace there and get back down to earth. But that's, that's what the, the Sharpies on Wall Street around the world do with our model, I think, is they, uh, they what, what's nice about it is that the call option pricing function, I mean, when we did our table, we assumed that the Black-Scholes model held. And then you get this formula up in the upper right-hand part of that. Uh, but the formula is, the, the proof is really an arbitrage proof and does not require that the Black-Scholes formula holds. So, uh, so it holds regardless of what determines call option prices. 
If you can just observe the prices, you can take these butterfly spreads and they should price uh, payoffs. Now that was in a discrete model. Um, and in a, uh, in a uh, model where the price can move continuously, uh, I should say right away that I have 80 slides. Uh, so I never go over them all. I just use them as kind of a reference document. And uh, I ask Helen to make them available to you. You're welcome to have them. But I have a hard time not showing every step along the way and every application that I can think of. Uh, but there's not enough time to talk about it. So anyway, if you do this more generally, if you take a butterfly spread, then it ends up having a triangular payoff that peaks at three if it's a two, three, four, and has zero up to three, and then starts going linearly from, uh, from zero to one dollar between three and four, and then linearly back down. So that's what really happens is if you don't have discrete price moves, where the price moves from zero to one to two to three, but instead goes from one to 1.01 to 1.02, goes by decimals, let's say, uh, then you get this triangular payoff. So that's what happens in reality is that. And we're looking at those butterfly spreads and we're getting these triangular payoffs. Then the thing that I was doing at MIT is I said, okay, so if I take those, and if I take a, a, a one, two, three spread, uh, uh, where now we're looking at interest rate options. We're looking at interest rate caps and floors. There are long-term options on interest rates. You know, that I, I skipped over that, but a, uh, but a cap is, is a security that pays off if rates go up. That basically, if rates go up to six and you've got a cap with a strike of four, it pays you two. If it goes up to eight, it pays you four. It pays you whatever the interest rate is minus the strike rate, uh, the exercise rate, or zero. Yeah, okay, so it's got the standard kind of hockey stick of payoffs. Now, I do think of that not as a call option, but as a put option on bond prices, because it wins when interest rates go up, which when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So this actually is a put on our set of puts on bonds. Uh, and floors pay off if rates go below the strike rate. So if it's a 4% floor, it pays off increasingly as rates go below 4. So they win if rates go down, which is when bond prices go up. So floors are like call options on bond prices, okay? But prices and interest rates always move in opposite way, uh, in opposite ways in the government bond market uh, without call, without options. Okay, so, so we're looking at these butterfly spreads. And, uh, and basically, I said, if you do a one, two, three butterfly, that gives you the red, uh, the red one. If you do a two, three, four, it gives you the next one. If you do a three, four, five, the next one. And if you held a portfolio of those, if you said, I'll take one each of those butterflies, the, the one centered around two, the one centered around three, and so on, they just kind of happen to cancel out and continue to, to pay off $1 up here, and you end up with a trapezoidal payoff. Um, and I feel like I don't know how to price trapezoids very well, uh, but if I can turn, if I can supplement that with a couple of other spreads and turn that into something riskless, I know how that the price of a riskless bond is just one over one plus R times that, or you know, the discounted present value. So, so basically, I take a left tail spread, which is where you buy if, if it was the last triangle was centered around two, you buy a two and short a one. That gives you the payoff on the left, and then. On the right, a right tail spread, if you buy an 8 and sell an 11 uh, cap, uh, then it gives you the payoffs on the right. And when you add that into my portfolio, then that kind of completes it to where you get $1 for sure. And that, I know, by arbitrage, needs to add up to the, uh, to the present value of $1 over whatever period you're talking about. So that's what we do. Uh, and essentially, I'm going to, oh, uh, there is a proof in here that basically says that these butterflies that give you the triangular payoffs uh, should be equal in value to a digital option that pays one dollar, like a, a two, three, four, that gives you the triangle around three, should have the same present value as something that pays off one dollar for sure, just a straight one between two and a half and three and a half. So it's like the, at the middle price plus or minus a half, and this is a little proof of that, which Litz came up with. I didn't do this. Uh, he saw this point and, and proved it. Uh, so that's an approximation of that. So what we do in this paper is summarize in a set of graphs that look like this. Um, now let me keep an eye on my time. I've got to keep moving here. Um, so we got the prices for interest rate caps and floors. And I got them from Bloomberg. Uh, for, in this case, I'm just showing you the end of year, 03, 04, 05, 06, and 07. 
and I compute those butterfly spread costs and the tail spread, use the tail spread for this zero, so that it's kind of like a one, uh, or actually now I kind of go long a two short of one to get the tail over here. Uh, and, and as it prices over here, the nine plus would be like long and eight short of nine, let's say, uh, cap. So I get these prices from Bloomberg uh, and compute uh, the price of each, uh, of each bet on these different interest rates, and this is what we came up with. So on 03, 4, 5, 6, 7, this basically says that like for 4%, if you go over here, 0.20, it, what this is, it means that if the, the security that pays $1, if rates are around 4%, which let's say is between 3.5 and 4.5, so it's a bet, it's like a lottery ticket that LIBOR will end up between 3.5 and 4.5. If that ticket pays off and that's where LIBOR ends up, you get $1. That is selling in the marketplace or was selling in the marketplace for about 20 cents. Okay, now it should sell, because the best, best you can get is $1, and if rates end up outside of that range, you get zero. So selling for 20 cents makes sense. And uh, it's the high, or the highest actually, I guess, is this five, in a couple of years, is 20 or 25 cents, and yet if you get down to rates that are way away from the center, then the price was very low, like four cents or, uh, uh, for the, four cents for the ones and four cents for the nines. And if you bought one of each of these, if you bought one of each of these bets, it's like, uh, I think of this as like a race that has 10 different horses in it. If there's a horse race out here, uh, and if there are 10 horses and you bought a ticket to win on all 10, you know, and, and the tickets, if you won, pay off $1, then you're gonna get $1 for sure, because one of the horses is gonna win. Uh, so the sum of all those has to be the price of a riskless $1 payment. Now, so if this is five years out, you know, it has to be the discounted present value of that, is the value of that. So I actually divide by that, divide by the zero coupon bond price, so that these will sum to one. And when they sum to one, they become what academics like to call a risk neutral density. I hate that phrase, but that's what they call it. Uh, so it's basically then when, we, when you take all of them and divide by the sum, then they've got to sum up to one. They're positive numbers because they're positive prices. So they look like a probability distribution. But they're in fact, of course, not probabilities. They're insurance prices. They're the price that someone would pay for, for a one dollar payment if rates happen to be one, versus if rates happen to be four, or versus if they happen to be nine. Now, and what should that reflect uh, there? Now, first of all, if you look at that, uh, let, me, let me leave that question. I've got a slide that will talk to that question. Uh, so I'll leave that dangling for a minute. Let me just say while well, I've got this one up there, look at the shape of this. So it's a relatively symmetric shape. It was 0, 03, 4, 5, 6, 7. The rates were around, LIBOR must have been around 4 or 5%. People thought that's what it would be five years from now or three years from now. This is five years. I look at three years out, five years out, and eight to 10 years out because there are interest rate caps that are traded two year, three year, four year, five, seven, and 10. Those are the active caps that I use their prices. Uh, anyway, it had a relatively symmetric shape. You might say, you know, there's kind of a weird point out here that if this is a correct one and not a data error, then that might be an indication that the market was worried about some tail risk. Now, as Litzenberg pointed out to me, you know, this is 9% plus. It's, this is the sum of kind of 9, 10, and higher. So that it may not be that much of a spike. It may be that we're just accumulating, you know, everything in the right tail. But it could also be an indication that the market was worried about tail risk in 03. Uh, now, if you looked at this for the euro area, I've got the prices of uh, caps and floors on euros, uh, and similar distribution, pretty normally distributed over the same time. And if you did that for the British pound, again, over the same time period, it was fairly normally distributed. Uh, okay, now here's, here's the point that I was about to make. Uh, this is the, uh, the theory that I don't want to go into too much, but this is the illustration that basically um, says it, that if these are the true probabilities, um, so we've got different interest rates and these are the securities that pay off if rates happen to be one, two, three, on up to eight. And let's, let's assume that those are the only rates it could be. And these prices are, these are the prices of the butter, butterfly spreads. If you normalize them by dividing by the sum, then you get these numbers, the normalized state prices. Um, and how do they relate to 
the true probabilities, which I'm just throwing out a set of numbers for the true probabilities. And there, what you should think about is that, that uh, if the interest rate ends up being 1% uh, versus end up being 8%, which security is worth more to most people? The one that pays off a dollar at 1% or the one that pays off at 8%? Let's say they're equally probable that they have pretty flat. In this case, I guess I've got 6% and 10. But let's say this is 10%, and the one is the one has the same probability as the 7 at 10%. But I've got here that the 1 is selling for 12.6, and the 7 is selling for 7.8 cents. And the reason is that I'm conjecturing that if rates end up at 1%, the reason that that's a very low rate. The reason we're having low rates is because the economy is bad. And so GDP growth is estimated like minus 2.3, that we're in a recession if rates are low. Whereas if rates end up at 7%, GDP growth in this illustration is plus 6. So it's like one pays off in good times, the other pays off in bad times. Which one is worth the most to people? Well, it's the one that pays off in bad times, because that's when your marginal utility for another dollar is worth more. Uh, you want to insure against the house burning down, okay? And if rates are low, the house is burning down. If rates are high, they're good times, and you don't need the money. So it's like, you know, that's totally compatible with capital asset pricing model, that essentially negative beta securities have the highest price, the good diversifiers, and positive beta securities that pay off when the economy is good, uh, have a low price and have to earn a high rate of return because they pay off only in good times. So these prices should reflect probability and marginal utility, both. So they're not just pure probabilities. Okay, now if you go, uh, I got, may want to skip over this section, but essentially uh, there is a little section in here, and, I, and this is where I thank them in the front of Bob Litterman, because Litterman, uh, when I pass this around a little bit, and I'm on the board of Common Fund with Litterman, he's the chairman, and uh, you know, I've got to be nice to him, but uh, he's, he's a great one, and he did famous work with Fisher Black on global asset value. Uh, and he said, well, okay, you know, these are not just probabilities, I and mean, Steve Ross also, uh, and I talked a lot about that. Um, and so, and what is the relationship between these prices and probabilities? And it comes through marginal utility. But, but I guess the point that I want to think about here is that the relationship is not so simple between interest rates and economic growth. If you think about our history, I know in the U.S. the history, uh, was that like in the 1970s and 80s, that sadly I, I remember well, uh, I, I, was, I was alive at that time and observing the economy. At that time we had in 74, 5 and 81, 2, big oil shocks, the economy went down, interest rates went up and the economy down. Interest rates up means bond prices were down at the same time the economy's down, which is the same time the stock market's down. So bonds had positive phases. Bonds were down at the same time stocks were down in the 1970s and 80s. Now, what's true today? If I just told you today that interest rates jumped, I mean, well, I mean, typically, I should say today, because we're kind of in a weird point in a monetary uh, situation right now. But if you ignore the last few days uh, and went back to the last five years, what's been the correlation, what has typically been the case about the correlation between interest rates and the stock market? What generally would be if the stock market goes up and there's good news about the economy, then interest rates go up. Okay, stock market's up. I told you the stock market jumped 500 points a, a, a couple months ago. Uh, you would probably said, okay, then interest rates uh, probably went up because we're waiting for a stronger economy and higher interest rates. So we have higher interest rates, which means bond prices then would fall when the stocks are up. So bonds would have negative betas. And indeed, that's what, that's what we see if you look at this correlation, this is the correlation of, uh, of treasury rate changes. And it used to be negative in the 70, 70s and 80s. That's negative beta of the rate with, with the S&P, which means that the price of bonds with the S&P is the reverse of that, is positive beta for bonds. And recently, then, it's been that when the stock market is up, interest rates are up, and bonds are down. So you get a positive correlation of rates with the stock market in the last 15 years, since about 2000, which means that bonds have negative betas, have had negative betas in the last 10 or 15 years. Bonds have had negative betas 
And they're diversifiers, okay? They're diversifiers in the sense that one reason to buy bonds, and one of the talks that I'm giving on this tour is, is kind of why buy bonds, is uh, the role of fixed income in asset portfolios. And one of the big pitches is, of course, that bonds are like insurance against bad economies most of the time. If the economy ends up being really bad, then the Fed and central banks will probably take interest rates very low, and bond prices will go up. So bonds pay off when, when the economy is bad, and that means they have negative betas, and they should have low returns, and they do have low returns. Uh, so anyway, that's the world we're living in. So let's flip the sign. So that's my point is, well, that Litterman kind of helped me kind of uh, want to explain that it's not so clear what the relationship is between interest rates and, uh, and the stock market there. Okay, I've got a little bit more there. Now let's go and, and get to the kind of the topic of the talk that, uh, that gives the headline here. But if you did this distribution, this is when one of the most dramatic moves uh, that we've had in the last decade was made by Ben Bernanke. Uh, ben and I were on the faculty at Stanford, so I know him. Uh, we were young professors together at Stanford, associate professors like in 82, 84. Um, and in June of 08, the distribution looked like these uh, salmon colored bars, and it was pretty normally distributed. In fact, I'm surprised it was so normally distributed because by that time, Bear Stearns had failed, and in July and August was when the, of 08 was when the concerns were raised about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and the Fed had to step in with that then. So times were already pretty stressful, and we still had a pretty normal distribution. But then Lehman Brothers fell, of course, in September, and lots of other institutions fell, and mergers happened in September, October, and there was panic in the markets in a very big way in October, November, and that's where Bernanke and his Fed came in in December and said, we're taking rates to zero, we're taking the short rate to zero. Well, then what did that do to the distribution? It changed it from this nice symmetric distribution to the blue bars, which are very positively skewed. It kind of slammed the interest rates down to zero and made it so that the price of the securities that pay off with very low rates went way up. Um, and so instead of having a normal distribution, we have a positively skewed distribution with kind of a long tail. And it's even a bit more interesting than that, and it was bimodal. And then it had kind of a dip here at 1% that, you know, the story I would tell is if the market's looking out, in this case I've got a three-year distribution, if it's looking out three years, they might say there are two alternate regimes about where we could be three years from now. One is that times are still very bad and we're in a terrible recession and rates are still near zero. And then the other one, which was usually, uh, or originally what people were betting on, was that rates would normalize pretty quickly. Within two or three years, we'll fix this problem, we'll get the economy back. And if that happens, then rates will go up to two or three or four percent. And so there was a lot of betting on that. So there's betting on two, three, four, and there's betting on zero. It's like two, two different possible regimes in the world. And we have distribution that may look a lot like this today. Uh, okay, so that's, that's how the Fed, in a way, I would say, change the distribution of future interest rates. And it's not just the probability distribution, it's really the insurance price distribution. It's not just probabilities. It, it includes margin of utilities. Okay. Uh, then what was interesting to me is that while the U.S. was struggling in 08, if you look at the European distribution, it was still quite symmetric. So it's like they weren't having much problem in 08 at that point. But of course they had their problems later on. And when you go to 2011, now, this was still a U.S. one. This is when we had the budget impasse, and the U.S. Congress and the President were fighting and couldn't get together. And Bernanke, and the stock market plunged like 10% in a few days in August of 11. And then that's when Bernanke came in and said, rates are zero now, and we are going to keep them extremely low for two and a half years. That was the middle of 11. We're going to keep them low through 2013. So that surprised the markets, that they would keep them low for that long. So this is low for longer. And look how the distribution changed. The market was, was thinking that they would be normalizing rates, and instead it slammed it back down to big money being bet on the zero rate. So again, the central bank had, I think, quite an impact on the distribution of future interest rates. Then in 2013, when Bernanke mentioned that he thought the economy was strong enough in May of 2013, and then again in June of 2013, that we could begin to taper off the asset purchases, and uh, and withdraw the stimulus, then the distribution went from this positively skewed 
back to where it was beginning to get symmetric again. Now, out of all the slides in my paper, if you ask me, you know, what do you think our future might look like, I think this slide may be what the future looks like. That if we finally get to where we say the economy's strong enough, we're going to start taking rates back up and eventually in two or three years get them up to the two or three or four percent, the distribution may indeed shift from where it's like this now to where it comes like that. I think this may be our future in the U.S. I don't know about other countries. Now this just shows that you can use our technique day by day. And this was when Bernanke announced the start of tapering in December, right before he left. And you can see how he shifts the distribution. So these illustrations kind of give, give us the title of the paper. The central bank has policy does see the impact of the distribution. Now there are a lot of other things going on, so it's not all just the central banks. Uh, you know, there are things that they don't control at all that affect uh, these interest rates, and uh, so it's not all others. This is when Yellen came in. Uh, early in her term, she said that uh, when the tapering is over, maybe six months after that, we might start raising rates. And the market thought that she would be more dovish than that, and so the market moved to where it shifted uh, to high, towards higher rates when she made that statement. Uh, so again, she had quite an impact with her play. Uh, then during the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, this is what happened when in 2011-2012 when we had the sovereign debt crisis, and Mario Draghi was brought in after Jean-Paul Trichet uh, had actually raised rates while the U.S. was hurting badly. They raised rates in Europe. Draghi came in, and of course, mid-summer uh, of 2011 was when people were worried about Spain and Italy following Greece and uh, having big troubles, and, and maybe they would default, uh, and who knows what would happen. Uh, so there was a lot of fear then, and Draghi came in and cut rates twice, came in November of uh, 2011 and cut rates twice quickly and transformed the distribution. The distribution was symmetric, the green bars, and went to positively skewed. Went to where rates were down. And then, of course, later on, Draghi says, uh, when uh, they were worried again about defaults and about protecting the euro while Greece was going through its troubles, he said it will do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And you can see that statement transformed. This is kind of before that statement, after that statement transformed the distribution quite a bit of what the markets were uh, expecting. Uh, okay, let's skip on over. This was, oh, well, this was uh, uh, when they started uh, quantitative easing. The ECB started quantitative easing. You can see uh, that shifted the distribution again towards where uh, the prices of the very low rate securities jumped way up. All right, let's skip to, uh, to the present. I need to Need to finish here a little bit. I've got the British pound there as well, but the British pound gets more interesting when we get to Brexit. So let me go to one of the slides that has Brexit in it. Um, so here we've got uh, one right here. Uh, all right. What, are the, there we go. what are the markets saying now? And I've got data for the US and the UK, some of the Bloomberg data for the Euro. Uh, my RAs were not finding, but uh, so that's not why it doesn't appear. But this, these are two graphs. This is the US and this is the UK. And uh, the first bar in each case is on Brexit voting day, June 23rd, when the outcome was not known, and indeed the markets were betting that they would remain. Then the next day we found that exit won, uh, and, and the markets plummeted, and interest rates plummeted, um, and that was like Friday, and then the following Monday they dropped some more. So there were two sharp drops, two days of sharp drops, June 24th and then June 27th. So, June 27th is the second bar, which turned out to be the low for the stock market. And after that, stocks started bouncing back. So what this shows is both in the US and, in, and certainly in the UK, the betting on low rates jumped up after the Brexit outcome was known. The, uh, the betting for very low rates, people said, OK, they voted for Brexit. There's going to be trouble for the economy. Bank of England's going to take rates down. Uh, and the price of the the low rate securities went up and the price of the high rate securities came down. Now, in the bounce back afterwards, now the, uh, the final bar is September 9th. So it was, so I know when I did this slide, I did it September 10th. So this was basically the present. This was a couple of days ago. Uh, I don't know what day it is today. What is it, the 15th now? Let's take a while to fly over here. Uh, but this was the latest data I could get, this is the final bar. And what you see is in the U.S., of course, the stock market has bounced back, bounced back, and now has dropped some. Uh, but at this point, it bounced back a lot. And the U.S. interest rates had come back down. Or, I'm sorry, the U.S. interest rates had gone back up. 
and the betting on low rates have gone back down. But the UK remains with a lot of Bank of England stimulus with even higher pricing of the low rate securities. Uh, so you can see the Bank of England's actions affecting that. This is the long term distribution, eight to ten, using eight to ten years out. Uh, this to me is quite surprising that in eight to ten years, so much money is being bet on the low rates. Um, and yet these are the bets on normalization. This is the bet on very low rates for the US. Now for the UK, of course, it's even more on low rates because people are worried a lot about whether Brexit will really hold the UK uh, growth down uh, for quite a while or maybe even have a recession. So it's even lower. Uh, now, what uh, this I just threw in, I've been working on this talk on the plane coming over. I did a bunch of things that I uh, had wanted to do that were on my list that I hadn't done yet. Uh, and I took basically stock options. So those, the, everything I've shown you is from interest rate options. You can also apply our technique quite generally to the stock market, and many others have done this too. Uh, but I did this, uh, uh, and I had my RA get essentially the, what Bloomberg has is they have the implied volatilities of options uh, by moneyness, as they call moneyness, which is basically where they're 20% out of the money, 10% out of the money, at the money, 10% in the money, 20% in the money. So they have different implied volatilities. And generally the ones that are very out of the money generally have higher volatilities than the ones that are deep in the money. Okay, that's the volatility smile that a lot of people have found, or a smirk sometimes they see. That, uh, I, I, to be honest, I can't say that I, I could draw a smirk very well, although I probably have it here. Uh, in, in any case, uh, I got that data, and I ran it through my model. I kind of programmed it to, to analyze that, and this is what I come up with. Uh, on, as the price of, this is the left tail. So this is if the stock market falls. This is if the stock market stays the same. This is so, so imagine starting the stock today at a price of 100. This is, this is the payoff on a security that pays off around 100 a year from now. If the stock market remains the same a year from now. Now what I mean by around is this means between 97 and a half and 102 and a half. So I've got five dollar increments here. So there's 100, 95, 90, 85, things like that. Five dollar increments. So this 100 represents like 97 and a half to 90. To 102 and a half to pay off on something there. Uh, all right, so the left tail is basically, uh, well, the last one I have here is 90, so that's 87 and a half to, to 92 and a half. This is then 92 and a half, and, or 87 and a half or lower. So this means the stock market drops by 12 and a half percent or more. This is the price of that bet. It drops by 12 and a half percent or more in one year. This is the price on the right tail of going up by 12 and a half percent or more. Okay, and you can see the price of the right tail gets up to about 15%. The price of the left tail gets up to 30%. Now, does that make sense that the left tail would be more expensive than the right tail? And given my comments about marginal utility, you should expect that, yes, that makes sense to me. But people want to insure against the left tail. This is bad, bad economy, stock market's down 10, 15% or more, 20 or 30%. That's the right tail, we're in good shape if the stock market goes way up. So the, the left tail should sell for more than the right tail, even if the distribution is basically symmetric. Now I've got a, uh, so that's basically on Brexit voting day, then this is at the bottom. And so at the bottom, what did you see? Uh, two days after the Brexit result was known, you see that people did pay up for, they were scared, and they paid up a lot for the insurance against even worse things happening, for the insurance against bad things happening. And then, as the world did not end and, and the economies were not affected as much as they thought, at least so far, then this came back down. And the market's kind of calmed down and didn't bet so conservatively. Uh, and that's as of a few days ago, okay? Um, now I have one more slide that I created and I just put together this morning. You know, I've, I've had been analyzing this for a few days, but I've never put this I've been looking at numbers, I didn't have a slide. So what I did is I basically went to the data for the S&P 500, going back with Ibbotson and Singfield's data, going back to 1926. I took that up to 1926 to 2015. And I kind of bucketed things and said, what percentage of the time does the stock market in one year uh, go up 12.5% or more? And what percentage of the time in one year does it go down by 12.5% or more? 
So what's the historical kind of frequency distribution? And you might think of this as if the future, or if the long-term past is an indication of the future, then these are like the true probabilities. Uh, these should be estimates of the true probabilities. And the other ones instead are market prices that reflect risk aversion. And what this means is that the left tail that's selling for a price of like 20 to 25 cents, the probability probability of that is only like 10 or 12 percent. I've got two different bars here. I've got the historic frequencies for the entire period uh, back to 19, it starts with 26, the first, uh, I, I have one year, one year returns in 27. So this one year return starting in 27 to 2015, uh, drop of 10 or 12 percent happened 10 percent of the time, and yet you paid 25 cents for that. So you're paying twice the probability for payoffs in this left tail. Whereas in the right tail, the frequency of, of being up 12.5% in one year actually happened a lot. In, in, uh, the la in the last nine years, it happened 50% of the time. And indeed, I thought, well, maybe that's just the last nine years, and these are the, these are the bad times, and that includes too many good times. So I, so I looked at 1971 to the present, and I also looked at just the last 20 years, 1996 to the present. So I didn't have too many bars, I just showed you 1996 to the present. 71 to the present looks a lot like the 27 to the present. And so the one on the right is, is 96 is the last uh, 20 years, and the one on the left is the last 90 years. Okay, so you can see in both cases, even in the last 20 years, 50% of the time, the stock market is up in 12 months by 12.5% or more. And yet that sells for only 12 cents. So that sells for like a quarter of the probability. That one sells for double the probability. So I view this as, as strong evidence of basically risk aversion. And investors are very risk averse. And they are really paying up to cover against the downside. And, you know, I'm kind of a speculator, which most of my life has been good to me and a few times not so good. Uh, I would say, this looks like awfully cheap to me. I'd be tempted to take that risk. I'd say, well, that's why I've kind of had a roller coaster uh, net worth, you know, uh, is I'm willing to take these risks. But, uh, but I would say, basically, this is evidence that there's a lot of risk aversion in the markets, uh, that, that these prices being paid are way above the historical probabilities for the, uh, uh, for the uh, bad scenarios. Okay, I need to stop there. Uh, and. Uh, this is the kind of research I'm doing where what, what I, we're trying to do is to apply uh, some of this work of extracting market information uh, from, uh, from option prices. I do have a few comments at the very end of the presentation that I've been throwing in that basically say, okay, uh, the economy today is not as bad as the economy was in 08 and 09, not nearly as bad. I think it's time we normalize rates. But when we get to that, it almost becomes political these days. So I probably should just stay away from that one and, and, uh, and stick with this. Maybe I should leave that to Dr. Chung. Uh, there. She can tell us what, uh, what the right thing to do is on that one.